Well, I grew up in a little town called Marion Junction, Alabama, okay? Where white people were ladies and gentlemen by days and Ku Klux Klan by night. And they hung somebody and yelled every weekend to set an example so you'd be a nice fella for the rest of the week, okay? Now that's the kind of environment I grew up in, okay? My father talked about his childhood, but to my knowledge, when my dad left Marion Junction, he never in his life went back. So, uh, and I think about time, see, you remember the time when I was kid, just before the two years before I got out of school, that's when the Scott Bull case come about. That kind of electrified the South, though we couldn't do nothing about it. We could have meetings in, in, in churches, and the sheriff would park his little Mall T Ford right outside to hear everything you say, so you wasn't going to say that much, because hell, you get beat up and lynched that night, all right? So, but you were smarting on the effects of it, okay? So when I graduated from high school in 37, I caught the freight train two weeks later. Going up north where everybody's supposed to be eager, because you got to remember, everybody who came back down south from up north come back and told us lots of lies. And that's tradition, you know, people tell lies. Oh man, we doing this and we doing it. And nobody came back south until they had an old piece of car. Well, what I remember about my dad was his humor. He was very highly intelligent. In fact, he was self-educated. He was an ordinary man who came from Alabama and, and learned how to read, to write, and how to write books. And you wouldn't expect that, given the fact that he had come from Marion Junction and and his, um, his lifestyle and how he grew up, but he was able to um, put his experience into words and capture it in books and, uh, and share that with others. You see, my father died when I was eight. So that was on my mother day. And she always told me, baby, you do whatever make you happy in life. <laughs> but she also said you ought to always try to do something that make the world a little better. He was warm, he was kind, he was fiery, um, passionate, um, and just generous. Generous with his time, generous with his spirit. Jimmy was one of the um, best people I ever ran into. He never acted as if he needed to exert himself to show that he, he felt he was stronger or, or a stronger intellectual than you were or, or a better person. He just act like he was just a normal person that if you just walked down the street and ran into a person that said hello to you, he would be just as open to just talk to you and talk to you for hours on hours. And, but the thing was, he wasn't just a normal person, he was a person that had a lot of experience as a political activist. And, and he really enjoyed talking to people and, and, and sharing the information, the knowledge that he had. Oh, James Fox was kind of like, um, kind of cantankerous really, but very uh, astute. So, but at, on a human level, he was a kind, generous spirit, um, very loving, very, uh, friendly. I uh, never saw anybody that he just didn't like. He didn't talk about people. He helped people. Good afternoon. And thank you all for coming here. Whether you came from out of town or whether you come out of one of the neighborhoods in the city of Detroit, today is going to mark a new chapter in the history of the city of Detroit. And we hope that you are going to be one of those founders who take us on another direction. Now, at this present moment, I would like to say to you, I think Detroit is in a state of transition. Detroit is a city which at one time was the mecca to wagon people all over this country. As he worked in the plant for many, many years. Uh, the Chrysler Jefferson plant, he saw the effect that uh, there was 
what was going on there specifically with automation coming into the plan. People came from the south, the north, the east, the midwest, and everywhere to Detroit because this was a place that first paid five dollars a day. Now I think five dollars a day to all you young people don't sound like much, but five dollars a day it really meant you could just about buy half the town back in those days. Now, this was also the town which I think you, some of you young people know was called the Arsenal of Democracy. That is where working people of all ethnic groups poured out their heart and energy during World War II to make it possible to fight the war in Europe and rid Europe perhaps for a short period of time of the fascist element that was, which was dominating Europe at that time. And so in that sense, Detroit has been one of the real very important centers where people of all different ethnic groups brought their culture together and made it at one time a great city. I'm quite sure when you look around, particularly you who come from the outside and look at Detroit today, you're going to wonder what happened to it. And those questions, when I had to answer them, drove me towards some of the ideas of Jimmy and Grace. For example, when we were doing organizing in Ecorse, Michigan, and Wyandotte, and Trenton, among young white working class youth, and we were talking about African Liberation Day and racism and the war in Vietnam and imperialism and the women's movement, I was astounded at the language of young white working class kids who were 15, 14, 16 years old, the language, the racist language they used. And Jimmy had once said that racism comes with the breast milk of so many, many, many white folks. And what Jimmy's ideas put forward was the relationship of racism and capitalism as a cultural struggle, as well as an economic and political struggle. Because our parents told us, you have to make a way out of no way. You don't hear people tell folks that now. All of us go around and say, I can't do nothing because this old racist society. I can't do nothing because this old capitalist society. I can't wait because these white folks around here messing with me. I can't do this, I can't. So that today, most of us are already frozen and locked. Yeah. He was challenging young folks, and we saw more young folks get involved, and that, to me, was very, very um, interesting to see more young folks get involved in um, the activities. Because something has happened to us. And that's why it's so important for you to be here today. Because you're going to have to try to change what happened to us in the past and help us make that first step on creating a new future. And let me say to you, even though you may come from other towns that you think you're doing well, I would not dwell upon it too long because what happened to Detroit may be a full runner of what's going to happen to most of the citizens in the United States. I met Jimmy when I was 16. I had come to the first orientation for Detroit Summer in 1992. Um, Jimmy was there and gave a speech. And what I remember is him saying that he was proud of all of the young people who had come to volunteer because um, most young people wanted to get paid to go to the bathroom, and yet we were there to give up our time and energy to revitalize Detroit and continue the work that he had been spending his time on, um, and he needed us to, to push forward. So don't have any illusion. The chips are beginning to fall. We are at a perhaps the most critical stage in the history of this country, where you, particularly you young people is going to have to ask yourself questions that you never had to ask before. Because I know most of you in here are going to school every day, and you probably was told that if you just go down there to that school and get some of that education, everything was going to be all right. Well, that isn't necessarily so. The enemy was not just out there of what the evil corporate greedy company was doing but workers themselves, and particularly white workers at this stage, had internalized 
decades and decades of individualism and putting the dollar above everything and selling their soul for the dollar, which began to also help me to understand the relationship of internal change, cultural revolution, and struggling against an external enemy. I would say that the rebellion stemmed from your life in the South. There was a certain rebellion. In fact, that was, that was in a lots of people, but they didn't express it in the same form, okay? People expressed it, their rebellions in many different forms. I expressed it by trying to find an organization that represent doing something about it. Other people took it out in all kind of ways. You'd be surprised how even during the war, people, I'd say, did sabotage work. You, you'd be surprised. And it was also the combination of him being an intellectual and a worker. So his, his um, relationship to different parts uh, of the movement, uh, his, his grounding within labor and also within Detroit's black community, and his directness, his forthright calling for a revolutionary change. <laughs> they are thousands of thousands of young people who are graduating from the University of Michigan, Yale, Princeton, and Harvard, <coughs> who are out there today <coughs> making hamburgers. There are thousands who graduated this year for the first time, haven't got any place to go. Now, I'm not knocking the concept or the narrow concept which we have bestowed upon education. But see, for me, I have always believed that education was more than just going down there to the school. Because if you go down to school, it's been my opinion, you only get skills and craft. But education is much more broader than that. And for the first time in your history, I'm saying, we are going to have to evolve to where we are going to have to create things which we never had to create before. Because of the changes that had happened in industry, because of deindustrialization, um, because of the rise of, um, of crack cocaine and the violence that was associated with it, and the way the cities were being tra transformed, he came to see the need for community building as um, a way for us to resist what was happening and to bring about the new, to transform our current reality and to create the new realities that we need to advance us as society and as human beings. He was an activist that we were trying to develop a youth group inside the city of Detroit to, to try to challenge African people, our younger people, to become more involved in the movement and, and, and refrain from um, moving into the area of crime and becoming criminals. So he was a person that we felt very, um, uh, we enjoyed meeting him and the knowledge that he had about the development of this country and the relationship of how racism has damaged our youth so as I understand it, uh, Jimmy and Grace were very vocally critical of the mayor um, of Detroit at the time, Coleman Young, specifically his um, plans to revitalize Detroit using casinos and building casinos. And they were against it. And Coleman Young said, well, what's your plan? And that question spurred them to think about what they might contribute to the revitalization of Detroit and also their experience with young people being so critical to every social justice movement in the country. Um, and they're noticing that when they were at marches or protests, they would see older people or they would see very, very young people, but not um, the in-between, the teenagers, the 20-somethings. And that led to a question too of where are the children? Um, and I think the combination of those questions, what's your plan for Detroit and where the children spurred them to found the Detroit summer. Would I might have been better off if I didn't know all this junk. And we getting in that now where the question gonna be like the, 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 the air condition is nice on your car, ain't it, when it's hot. Yeah, but the Freon. But the Freon is gonna mess you up. Mm -hmm. So we getting in where now, see, in the early stages of all this creativity, we didn't think about the effects. Mm -hmm. We went from the mule, the horse, and the horse shit and the cow shit for fertilizer right back, and everything was just going around the circle. You know what I mean? The mule and the horse did the work in the field, mm -hmm. get the cotton and corn, and then they eat the corn, and that corn, they, they treat the corn, and then the corn was right back down there again. That was working fine, right? We weren't changing nature at all. All right? 
But nowadays, we change nature. So in 1963, he projects the creation of the underclass and the outsider class. And he saw that technology was creating a permanent displacement of people. And I always say I represent three things, agriculture, industrialization, and automation. I have lived through that three developments. I think he thought he needed to figure it out because it was something that was beginning to affect our lives. Um, as he talks about automation coming and changing um, the workforce in the auto industry, and then I, it's, I think he'd be even amazed at what has come. Um, but I think his relationship to technology was that it was replacing our human relationships, or we were allowing it to replace our human relationships. And how do we, how do we have progress without losing our connection to one another? Well, he would always say, what would be the thing that we need to do that's more positive? not just fighting against things that are negative. What is our vision? He'd want to keep in front of us that there needs to be a vision that's driving the work that we do, not just a complaint. And that vision has to do not just with the external world, but also internally, that how we're changing ourselves to change the world too. So at a certain point, I think in society, we have to see what are the effects of some things which we call progress. Mm -hmm. And then maybe was that really progress or not? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think there'll ever be a total repudiation of anything we do. You know what I mean by? I don't think people say now that we got a automatic such and such and such, we gonna go back to the old days. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the point. Mm -hmm. But I think we do have to ask ourselves, what did that transform in our life? Now, and I don't, now I'll just give you that. Now, there's no question. I go up to this Ford Hospital, they got the most physical machines you ever seen up there. There's no question medically they can find out things about you that they never know. Also, they done created things. And you keep asking yourself, now, would it have been better if I didn't know this or not? <laughs>